بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Zaytuna College a Muslim liberal arts college in Berkeley, California Over the course of four years of undergraduate study a Zaytuna education provides students with the tools of learning to read well think systematically, and communicate effectively. Students apprehend the basic acts of the mind through courses on logic and mathematics. Rhetoric instructs in the power of persuasion. Economics, ethics, politics, and community service inculcate an understanding of virtue, citizenship, and governance. The history of science and philosophy inform us of the human quest for truth, and purpose. Astronomy connects our inner wonder to the expanse of the universe. The core abilities of reading well and understanding deeply are essential for a solid grounding in the Islamic scholarly tradition, a goal that is embedded in Zaytuna College's mission statement. To this end, the college offers no less than 16 courses in Islamic history, law, theology, spirituality, and scripture, along with five years of dedicated work in the Arabic language, literature, and rhetoric. One of these five years is a prerequisite for admission to the four-year undergraduate program. It is an intensive program. It keeps us all busy. But there are a few brave souls who want and crucially, can handle more. For them, the college has designed an honors program, which consists of the study and memorization of seminal didactic poems and other key uh, material to serve as memory pegs in the disciplines of tajweed, aqidah, hadith, tasawwuf, usul, fiqh, sira, and mantiq. The texts are taught over a three-year cycle. To complement the conventional college setting of the four-year undergraduate program, the college determined that the honors program be in a setting of traditional learning and accessible to the wider public. This is your college. It is our college. The goodwill, donations, and prayers of each and every one of you have enabled us to be here today. We have called the program Living Links to accentuate that if the texts are the doors to knowledge, the teachers, through whose hearts the texts flow in an unbroken chain of transmission, are the keys. They are the living links. Before we begin our first class, I would like to extend a special note of gratitude to Asad Tarsin and the Dean Intensive for partnering with Zaytuna College in order to bring this program to the wider community. Thanks also to the wonderful staff and volunteers who have worked tirelessly under the leadership of Wahid Rashid to bring this program to us on a Saturday. Ustad Farad Khan has kindly agreed to be the faculty coordinator for Zaytuna College. He will also be teaching several of the classes, including co-teaching the Jawharat at tawheed with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf this year. May Allah bless these gatherings. And now, let me welcome Imam Zaid Shakir, co-founder of Zaytuna College, chairman of the board, and senior faculty member, to begin the first class on the hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما ثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 
wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi alkitaba wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a great blessing to be here and uh, what we're going to be doing, you have the outline, is the... Commentary on the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah wa nafa'anullahu bihi wa bikum ajma'in. The text that we're going to be using, and we'll talk about it uh, a little more next week, is Imam Nawawi's commentary on these 40 hadith. And uh, so there's a commentary on the Arba'in that's attributed to Imam Nawawi. Uh, there's some uh, debate amongst the scholars as to rather... It's a, a truthful and accurate attribution. Most feel that it is. And as I said, we'll discuss this briefly uh, next week after dealing with some introductory matters this week. So what we like to do this week is discuss, as is written on your outline, uh, the life of Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, wa nafa'anullahu bihi wa bikum ajma'in. And then his introduction to the Arba'in, and in the context of that introduction, mention a few things about the study of hadith over and beyond what he himself mentions. As for the first hadith, inshallah, we'll start that next week because I think what we've uh, mentioned here will take the majority of the time and then leave some time for questions. Also, a thing, uh, one reason the commentary of Imam Nawawi is chosen, I have a copy here, is that it's brief enough to uh, go through cover to cover uh, over the course of the academic year. So that's one of the reasons it was chosen. Whereas some of the uh, more well-known commentaries, such as Ibn Rajab al Hanbali's Jam al Ulum wal Hikam, would take several years to go through, uh, or Fathul uh, Mubin by Sheikh uh, Ibn Hajjul al Haytami would also take several years, if not several decades. And the same for Jam al Ulum wal Hikam. So uh, this is uh, a brief commenta- uh, commentary. It also provides us an opportunity to. Uh, not only enjoy the blessings to be found in the Arba'in itself, uh, but also uh, the blessings of Imam Nawawi's commentary on these hadith that have been so judiciously chosen to be passed on to posterity. So there's a lot of blessing in using his commentary and also Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. And also, it's as I said, it's, it's brief enough for us to cover uh, from beginning to end over the course of the academic year. So to start with Imam Nawawi's life, Imam Nawawi, uh, may Allah have mercy on him. On him. Uh, his name is Yahya bin Sharaf. His uh, nickname is Muhyiddin. His kunya is Abu Zakaria. So uh, he's one of the greatest scholars of this ummah. One of the distinguishing attributes of Imam Nawawi is his, his shyness. He was very shy, especially shy before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so out of his shyness and his humility, he was also extremely humble. Rahimahullah, he disliked being called by Muhyiddin. Because Muhyiddin, those of you familiar with Arabic, reviver of the religion. So he didn't, even though this was a nickname, he didn't want it to be applied to him in any way, shape, or form as the reviver of the religion out of his uh, humility. And the humility that he exemplified, the other world, the worldly abstinence, it's related that he only owned one garment, an ankle-length uh, robe with a one single button at the collar, and then his turban and his sandals, rahimahullah. Most of the books that he used for his voluminous writing and research, he borrowed. 
from others. They want his personal possessions. Rahimahullah. Uh, and this is very, very important for us because we live in an age where the egos are encouraged to take free reign and for people to exalt and elevate themselves. Uh, one of the tribulations that some of us face is that people want to take your picture. Can I take a picture with you? If you say no, they'll say you're arrogant and stuck up. And so, and if you do it, you're in, on thin ice. But a recent phenomenon I notice is like, uh, oh, you say, okay, listen, if, okay, go ahead. They say, no, so have this person do it. No, I want a selfie. So it took me a few days to figure out what a selfie is. That's S-E-L-F-I-E, a selfie. Like, I want to take my own picture. So just the, the arrogance of taking the picture is compounded by, I want to do it myself so I can say, I took this picture. So the I, the I, the me, 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 is, is pervasive in our day and time. And this is probably one of the reasons people have become so small. Like we look back on the likes of Imam Nawawi, they were giants. And one of the reasons they were giants is because of their humility. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had mentioned, مَا نَقَصَتْ صَدَقَةٍ مِنْ مَالٍ وَمَا زَادَ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا بِعَفْوٍ إِلَّا عِزَّةٍ وَمَا تَوَادَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ That charity will never decrease your wealth and Allah only increases a servant who has the wherewithal to pardon others in honor. And no one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. So Allah elevated Imam Nawawi in ways that we'll mention shortly. So Imam Nawawi was born in 631, the 631st year after the Hijra, and he died in 676, so the 676th year after the Hijra. His birth date corresponds to 1233 A.D., to get an idea of the time that he lived in, rahimahullah ta'ala. So he lives a very short life, and uh, we'll mention one of the theories related to that momentarily. Uh, from a young age, he was born into a pious family. His name, Nawawi, is a, an attribution to Nawa. Nawa is a, then a village, now a small town in Hauran. So it's an area where the Golan Heights near the corner of present-day Palestine, uh, Syria, and Lebanon. So it's in the, the southwestern region of Jabal al-Sheikh, in Hauran. So those of you familiar with uh, Syria and that part of the world. Uh, the buildings there, historically, were built from black lava rocks. And still today you can see a lot of the buildings built in that style and from that material, but the more contemporary concrete cinder blocks are starting to predominate. But that region was well known for the black uh, lava rock construction of, of the buildings. If you go to Busra, which is further east, where the Prophet ﷺ went, you'll see that very distinctive uh, building material being used even in the, uh, the uh, monastery of uh, Bahira. The monk who met the Prophet ﷺ is made from those black stones. In any case, so it's attribution to Nawa. Uh, as Imam Nawawi grew into childhood, and he, he was very, very, a very serious child. His parents were very pious people, so they uh, introduced him to knowledge and to teachers and introduced him to the memorization of encouraged him to memorize the Quran and begin his religious studies in Nawa. He distinguished himself both there and after he moved at a young age with his father to Damascus. He was an uh, outstanding student and we'll read a little from his own account 
of uh, his affair as a student. Uh, one thing that uh, happened uh, to him, in fact, we'll read it now. So this is from one of the biographies, this one by Imam al uh, Most of what is related from Imam, uh, concerning Imam Nawawi's life is from his student, Ibn Attar. So he says, Rahimahullah, Uh, Ibn Attar وَحُكِيَ لِي وَالِدُهُ وَحَكَى لِي وَالِدُهُ أَنَّهُ مِنْ حِينَ تَوَجَّهْنَا مِنْ نَوَى أَخَذَتِ الشَّيْقِ حُمَى This one he went for his hajj فَلَمْ تُفَارِقْهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ عَرَفَى وَهُوَ صَابِرٌ لَمْ يَتَأَوَّهْ قَطْ فَلَمَّا تَمَّ الْحَجُّ ووصلنا إلى نوى ورجع هو إلى دمشق صب الله عليه علم صب. So he relates Imam Nawawi, despite he was a, a noted student, noted for his memory, his seriousness. He didn't play with the other kids. He didn't involve himself in nonsense. But when he made Hajj with his father, he says his father related to me. That when we set out from Nawa, the Sheikh Imam Nawawi was afflicted with a fever. This fever did not leave him until the day of Arafah. So this is a period of several months. And he was patient. He never uh, moaned or complained, never, during the time of this fever. Then when the Hajj was completed, and we reached, uh, we arrived at Noah, and then he returned to Damascus. Allah poured knowledge into his heart. So Allah poured knowledge into his heart. So he had a great opening. And so part of that was his bearing difficulty with no complaint. This is very important for students of knowledge, because part of the egotistical culture is the tendency to complain. Because I, there's the I. Some of you know Arabic. What, what do they call egoism in, in, in Arabic? Anania. So the ana, the I. I don't like this. I don't think I should be doing this. I think I should be doing something else. I want to read another book. I want to have another teacher. I want to have a little time to play, what is it, Grand Theft Auto 3.0. So the I gets in the way. The I wasn't a factor in Imam Nawawi's life. And so when the I is removed, that clears up the space for divine miracles to happen, divine secrets to unfold. And so a person can take their chance with themselves, with the I, or they can trust in Allah. So the, the humility might not be something one is naturally inclined towards. But for the sake of Allah, the person does it. And then, إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Then Allah elevates them. The person who relies on the I will elevate themselves. Believe me, you won't get very high. You won't get very high relying on the I. But if you rely on Allah, you'll go very far. Inshallah ta'ala. Because there are no limits. There are no limits. The eye is limited. The greatest eye on this planet has his or her limitations. It's inherent. It's inherent to who we are. It's inherent to our nature. And the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are no limitations. Limitations do not apply with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا تَوَادَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ 
In terms of his studies, Rahimahullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. This is what Imam uh, Nawawi mentions himself. وَلَمْ يَزَلْ يَشْتَغِلُوا بِالْعِلْمِ وَالْعَمَلِ So he continued to uh, preoccupy himself with seeking knowledge, teaching knowledge, and devotional actions. بِحَيْثُ ذَكَرَ الشَّيْقُ لِي To such an extent as the Shaykh mentioned to me, so Imam Nawawi mentions this to Ibn Attar, أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقَرُوا كُلَّ يَوْمٍ إِثْنَ عَشْرَ دَرْسًا عَلَى الْمَشَائِخِ شَرْحًا وَتَصْحِيحًا That he would read 12 lessons every day with his teachers and not just read them, go through them critically, commenting on them and correcting various aspects. So the voweling might be off or a name might be uh, 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 in error or a, a manuscript might be in conflict with another. All those corrections would be made in the course of those 12 lessons every day. Darsaini fil wasit. So two lessons in fiqh at that time from Imam Ghazali's al wasit. Imam Ghazali was also one of the imams in the Shafi'i Madhab in addition to his renown in the area of tasawwuf. Wa thalithan fil muhadhab. And a third in the Muhaddab, which is Imam Shirazi's book in Fiqh, and Imam uh, Nawawi's great work, al uh, uh, Shar al Muhaddab, is this book of Imam Shirazi. Wa darsan fi usul al fiqh, a dars in jurisprudential principles. Taratan fi luma li Abi Ishaq, sometimes in the book of uh, Luma li Abi Ishaq, wa taratan fi al Muntakhib li Fakhr al Razi. And Sometimes the lesson in usul al-fiqh would be from the mantaqib of Imam Fakr al-Din al-Razi. darsan fi asma rijal A lesson in uh, accurately ascertaining the names of the narrators of hadith. It's a very uh, technical ha- science in the sciences of hadith. darsan fi usul al-Din. And a lesson in... Uh, usul al-Din in this context meaning uh, all likelihood aqida or ilmul kalam. Qala wa kuntu u'alliqu jami'a thalika yata'alliqu biha min sharhi min sharhi mushkilin wa yudahi ibaratin wa dabti lugha. And he said, all of these I would uh, make the needed comments concerning explaining difficult passages or wording, clarifying uh, vague or ambiguous expressions, and accurately uh, determining the voweling of the Arabic language. So everything properly voweled, full Arab. All of these 12 lessons, this was the way that Imam Nawawi approached his study every day. Then he says, وَبَارَقَ اللَّهُ لِي And Allah blessed me فِي وَقْتِي In my time وَشْدِغَالِي And my, what I was preoccupied with وَأَعَانَنِي عَلَيْهِ And He assisted me in this matter وَقَطْرَ لِي لِشْدِغَالِ بِعِلْمَ الطِّبْ And He said, then I thought about uh, delving into medicine فَاشْتَرَيْتُ الْقَانُونَ so he said, I bought the Qanun, the classical medical text of Ibn Sina, which was the longest continually studied textbook in human history, uh, in medicine. وَعَزَمْتُ عَلَى اشْتِغَالِ fi, And I made up my mind, I'm going to get involved in medicine. فَعُذْلِمَ عَلَيَّ قَلْبِي My heart was darkened. وَبَقِيتُ أَيَّامًا لَا أَقْدِرُ عَلَى الاشتغال بشيء. And uh, uh, several days passed, I wasn't able to do anything. فَفَقَرْتُ فِي أَمْرِي مِنْ أَيْنَ دَخَلَ عَلَيَّ الدَّاخِلِ And I thought, and I reflected on my affair. Where did this uh, uh, disruption in the clarity of my thought, where did it come from? فَالْأَلْحَمَنِ اللَّهُ أَنِشْدِغَالِي بِالْتِبِّ سَبَبُ 
And Allah inspired me to realize that my preoccupation with medicine was the reason for this darkness that descended on my heart. فَبِعْتُ فِي الْحَالِ الْكِتَابِ الْمَذْكُورِ And I immediately saw the Qanun, the book that's been mentioned. وَأَخْرَجْتُ مِنْ بَيْتِي كُلَّ مَا يَتَعَلُّكُ بِعِلْمِ الطِّبِ and I removed from my house everything associated with medicine. فَاسْتَنَارَ قَلْبِي وَرَجَعَ إِلَى حَالِي وَعُدْتُ لِمَا كُنْتُ عَلَيْهِ أَوَّلًا And he said that my heart became illuminated again and my state returned and I returned as I was previously. Now this isn't a condemnation of studying medicine. So doctors and med students relax. But it's, it's just reminding us that if a person is giving themselves to the study of the religion, then this is what you give yourself to. This is what you give yourself to. Because it has its requisites and it has its demands. And one of its demands is sincerity of intention. So if you want to be a doctor, be a doctor. If you want to be a scholar, be a scholar, a religious scholar. And you can be a doctor and a religious scholar, like Ibn Sina. But not everyone's Ibn Sina. <laughs> Allahu Musta'an. But it's just emphasizing the intensity of niya and accepting what Allah, Allah pulled him. He said, Allah blessed me and Allah assisted me in this. Allah illuminated my heart. And so anything that would create worldly attachments and worldly entanglements was a source of blocking that light. And just as they're enlightened doctors and engineers. And this is one of the things that we emphasize at Zaytuna College is the incumbency of the doctor and the engineer also being conversant in the religion. So that ethics and morality are never separated from professional endeavors. This is the crisis of our society. Ethics and morality, which historically has been rooted in religious teachings, have been separated from professional endeavors. So we have a lot of unethical professionals out there. May Allah spare all of us. So this is a re, uh, just the, the knowledge coming from Allah. So to just reiterate, what did he say after he returned from Hajj? Sabba Allahu alayhi alayhi al-ilma sabba. Allah poured knowledge into his heart. You say, this isn't from me. So uh, a, a couplet that's attributed to Imam Shafi that's well known and oft mentioned. I mention it a lot. Myself, he always says, Shakautu ila waki'in, ila waki'in su'a hifzi. Farshadani ila tark al-ma'asi. فَأَخْبَارَنِي بِأَنَّ الْإِلْمَ نُورُ نُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُهْدَى لِلْعَاصِي I complained to Waqi'ah, my memory is dimming. He instructed me to leave off all sin, and then he informed me that knowledge is a light, the light of Allah that's not given to a sinner. The knowledge of Allah that's not given to a sinner. So the, this is the light of Allah. This is an affair, seeking knowledge that connects us to the divine. And we pray Allah gives us a strong connection in, in that regard. So Imam Nawawi was known for his work ethic, for his sincerity, for his worldly detachment. He was also known during his life for his courage in standing up to the oppressors of his time. <clears throat> so one of the Leaders, political leaders during this time was Zahir Baybars. He was a great hero. He was one of the leaders that were instrumental in pushing back the Mongol hordes as they had swept across the heartland of Islam. So he was a, a great warrior and respected leader. He had saved in part the eastern, uh, western rather, realms of the Ummah from the Mongol hordes, but he was known to have usurped lands unjustly, some instances, and other transgressions of Sharia. Imam Nawawi would be the one 
people would send to him. When he didn't go in person and rebuked him and Babars said that this man puts fear in my heart. And this should be the role of the scholars. The scholars should never be the, the handmaidens of those in power. The scholars should be the ones who speak the truth to those in power. This is called the best jihad. Aftalul jihad. Kalimu tuhaqqin inda sultan and ja'ir. The best jihad is speaking a word of truth in the face of a tyrannical ruler. So Imam Nawawi was a mujahid in this sense. And when, when they, the scholars would write letters, Imam Nawawi would write the letter and sign it and they would sign after him. So they took shade and the, 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 they took, sought protection in the shadow of his courage. Rahimahullah. So he was well known for that. For, so there are three things uh, many of his biographers note in summarizing his life. One was his scholarship. And, and we'll talk about his scholarly legacy in a moment. One was his scholarship. One was his asceticism, his piety, his detachment from the world. And another was his speaking truth to those in power. Speaking truth to those in power. May Allah uh, have mercy on him. Now we mentioned his early death. There are several theories uh, as to why he died young. One theory is that his health was always, uh, he was frail. And frail health. And one reason for that is mentioned that is, is presented one explanation, not a reason. Allahu alam as to the reason. One explanation for that is Imam Nawawi would not eat any of the produce from in and around Damascus. He would, his father would send them dried fruits and vegetables from Nawa periodically. The reason he wouldn't eat any of the produce from in and around Damascus is because he considered all of that land to have been usurped from his rightful owners, the farmland. And therefore, anything grown on it was haram. And so he refused to eat it. Rahimahullah. And it's said that that contributed to his frail health. Imam Nawawi, as noted by one of our great 20th century scholars, the great Syrian scholars, uh, scholar Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. He wrote a book on the, the great scholars who never married, the bachelor imams. One of them was Imam Nawawi. And one of the reasons given for that, or I did it again, one of the explanations for Imam Nawawi not marrying was that uh, he feared he wouldn't be able to give his, his wife the rights owed to her because of his preoccupation with knowledge. And therefore, he would be oppressing her. And he feared he would meet Allah as an oppressor. Rahimahullah. So for that reason, he didn't marry. Because the wife has rights. And he feared he wouldn't be able to fulfill and extend to her the rights that were owed to her. So for that reason, or that's one of the explanations given for his marriage, uh, lack of not marrying. One was another explanation related was just the, his passionate attachment to knowledge and to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it said he was his ilm and amal. He was devoted to knowledge and, and worship, rahimahullah. And in the Shafi school, Imam Nawawi was... He's, in fact, the imam of the Shafi school. So the one who rarefied the school. And his book, Minhaj al-Talibin. And then that, that's the principal source of fatawa in the Shafi school, Minhaj al-Talibin. So uh, Imam, imam Nawawi was a, a great faqih, a great alim uh, in the Shafi school. His uh, intellectual legacy and uh, his standing with Allah and we say standing with Allah indicated by the tawfiq that he had, the success that Allah facilitated. And unfortunately, there are people contemporarily, they'll say, Imam Nawi was a deviant. 
because he adhered to the Ash'ari school in theology and burn his books. But here's a scholar the Ummah has greeted with acceptance. Rahimahullah. And Allah Ta'ala has given tawfiq, and we'll mention a sign of his tawfiq. The most widely read small compilation of prophetic hadith is the one that we're dealing with, the Arba'in of Imam Nawawi. The most widely circulated large compilation of prophetic hadith is Riyadh al-Salihin, Imam al-Nawawi. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The, we mentioned the standard of fatawa in the Shafi school is Minhaj al-Talibin, lil-Imam Nawawi. The scholar that preceded Imam Nawawi as uh, the chief reference in the Shafi school, Imam uh, al-Rafi, the most widely circulated source of Imam Rafi's teaching in the madhab is Rawda Talibin that was also written by Imam Nawawi, which is a commentary on Imam Rafi's work. Rahimahum, rahimahum Allah Ta'ala. The most widely circulated uh, book of comparative fiqh and one of the most widely respected is the Majmu'ah or Sharh and Muhaddab of Imam al Nawawi. So it's a work in the Shafi school, but it's a work in comparative fiqh that's widely respected because of the fairness of Imam Nawawi in presenting the arguments of the other school and oftentimes accepting their arguments as stronger than the Shafi opinion. There are some scholars, they present their own school's argument and then they'll present a straw man argument, representing the argument of the other school, one they can easily dismiss. So you see all the Hanafis, their opinion's weak. They found the weakest version of that opinion so they could elevate their own school. But Imam Nawi in the Shah of the Muhaddab, which is called the Majmu'ah, widely known as the Majmu'ah, because it, he started it and got into the book of Riba and then Imam Subki uh, continued it and then one of the Shakir brothers, the great Egyptian scholars uh, in the 20th century completed it. So it's a compilation of three scholars but the bulk of the work and the foundation in terms of the methodology employed in the work is that of Imam al Nawawi and his Shar al-Muhaddab of Imam al-Shirazi. The... Uh, one of the most, two of the most widely studied books, one a brief book and one a more lengthy compilation in uh, Hadith studies. Mustalah al-Hadith is the Taqrib of Imam Nawawi and the Irshad of Imam Nawawi. Uh, one of the most uh, widely circulated books, if not the most widely circulated a uh, compilation of prophetic invocations is Kitab al Adhkar lil Imam Nawawi, Rahimahullah. One of the most well known, but it's not a, a, a major, considered a major compilation, but in the science of Tasawwuf is Imam Nawawi's Bustan al Arifin. So you can see in all of these areas, and then other in his work in technical areas of hadith, Asma'a Rijal, uh, also Imam Nawawi is considered one of the principal scholars. So if you look across this wide range of scholarly endeavor, of the books that have been used throughout the centuries to this very day, and the most widely circulated, they're the books of Imam Nawawi. Rahimahullah wa nafa'an Allah bihi wa bikum ajma'in. So for someone to, to stand up in the face of that and to accuse Imam Nawawi of, of deviance, this is the epitome of arrogance and, and may Allah help anyone who would fall in that, that position. And, and one of the, well, there, there are many uh, scholars we can refer to in terms of what should be the approach uh, towards the 
scholars who were preceded us, if we happen to agree with the scholar who finds something they believe to be erroneous in their scholarship. Notice the wording. If we happen to agree with a scholar who finds, because we're not the people to say, I, oh, I think Imam Noah, we messed up here. Who am I to challenge? No, I, I agree with Imam Suyuti's opinion concerning this issue in Imam Nawawi scholarship. So I agree with a scholar who has the right and the qualifications to make that sort of judgment. And it's best to just uh, trust in Allah and remain silent. Allahu Musta'an. So those are just some... Uh, and, and a final note concerning the life of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah is... Uh, when before his death, and it was as if he sensed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was calling him back, he returned all of his books to the libraries or the individuals he had borrowed them from. He went to visit all of his teachers uh, in Damascus. He went to visit Jerusalem. And then he returned to Nawa and he passed away, rahimahullah. And it said a sign of his humility if you go to his grave, you'll notice it's in the middle of the old cemetery in Nawa. There's no building over it. There's no dome. There's a massive tree. So the tree is, is it's as wide, the trunk is like a, a mature wed, redwood tree. It's not tall as a redwood tree. It's maybe you know, twice as tall as this room, high, twice as high as this room. But it's massive trunk that grew out of his grave. And they said twice before this tree uh, grew out, they tried to build a, uh, a building and a dome over his grave, and each time it collapsed. Rahimahullah. And so it was as if his simplicity, Allah Ta'ala was guarding even his grave from any ostentatious show of pomp or ceremony or distinction that even in the, in the grave, his humility is affirmed. Rahimahullah. And if you go to Syria, may Allah give relief to the people of Syria. May Allah give relief to the people of Syria. May Allah protect them from all of the schemes and machinations that are descending upon their land. May Allah end this conflict. May Allah end the conflict there. And bless the people of peace and to... to the freedom to practice their religion and the freedom to live in peace. But, and when that happens, when you go to visit, you have to go to Nawa to visit Imam Nawawi's grave. This is, you have to put this on your to do list. It's maybe an hour and a half max from Damascus. There are many different stories too you could relate concerning that, but we'll stop there. Rahimahullah wa nafa'na Allahu bihi wa bikum ajma'in. So, uh, how much time do we have? Okay. So, we'll try to get through the introduction to uh, his, uh, his introduction to the Arba'in. Uh, so, he says, Rahimahullah, wa nafa'ala Allahu bihi wa bikum ajma'in, bismillah, rahman, rahim. And so, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the one who extends mercy to others. Uh, we could say in the name of Allah, the one who is merciful in this world and the next, the one who is exceedingly merciful. He starts with the basmalah, and this is the sunnah of Allah. Allah, the Quran starts with the basmalah. In the mushaf, there are various opinions. Is the basmalah part of the fatiha or not? But there's no difference of opinion whatsoever that the written Mus'haf starts with the basmala. So this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would begin his affairs with the basmala. It's the, and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كُلُّ عَمْرٍ ذِي بَالَ يُبْدَعُ فِيهِ بِبِسْمِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ أَوْ هُوَ أَبْتَعُ أَوْ هُوَ أَقْتَعُ 
So any affair of any import that's begin, not began with the Bismillah is cut off from blessings. So we should make this our habit. All our noble things, uh, we should begin with Bismillah. Something vile, so if there's a roach on your floor and you decide to the, swat the roach, don't say Bismillah. Any noble thing that uh, we undertake should start with the Bismillah, this, this Sunnah. Of the Messenger of Allah is the Sunnah of the Ulama. The Ulama open their compilations, their speeches with the Bismillah, Bismillah, Man Rahim. Similarly, so Allah follows the uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So this is also the Sunnah of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, and the Sunnah of the Ulama. So in the name of Allah, the Merciful, the Mercy Giving, all praises due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. He is the one who sustains the heavens and the earths. And his sustaining power is never separated from this creation. If it was, the creation would cease to be. He's the one who organizes and arranges the affairs of all creation. بَعِثِ الرُّسُلِ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهُ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَجْمَعِينَ He's the one who has sent the messengers, may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon all of them. إِلَى الْمُكَلَّثِينَ To those who are religiously responsible, us. And this is something we should never forget. We are religiously responsible. We are responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to undertake the Burden of religion he has imposed upon us. And I say burden hesitatingly. Uh, there's a better word for that. Because the, when one, and this is why we strive to consciously purify and rarefy our hearts so that our hearts are filled with the love of Allah. And when that happens, there is no burden in the duties that we have. No fajr, four o'clock, summertime, no problem. I'm going to get up at 3.30, make sure I'm up and alert. No problem. So we mentioned uh, in one of our classes recently that some misguided people, they say that when you arrive to a strong connection with Allah at a spiritual level, now there's no physical connection with Allah then you don't, you're not religiously responsible. So they say, لَا تَكْلِيفَ بَعْدَ الْوُصُولِ And this is a, a, a total mistake. If it were true, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wouldn't would have not, at a certain point, stopped praying, stopped fasting. But the greater the gifts he received Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more pure and more uh, copious his worship as an expression of thanks to his Lord, and appreciation to his Lord. When Aisha radiallahu anha mentions, كَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلْمُ يَقُومُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ حَتَّى تَوَرَّمَتْ أو تَفَطَّرَ حَتَّى تَوَرَّمَ أو تَفَطَّرَ قَدَمَاهُ فَقُلْتُ لِمَا تَصْنُ هَذَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَقَدْ غَفْرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَعَخَّرَ فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَفَلَا أُحِبُّ أَنْ أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم So it's related the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He used to stand at prayer at night until his feet cracked or until his feet swole up. And Aisha, she says that I said to him, May Allah be pleased with her, O Messenger of Allah, why are you doing this when Allah has forgiven any mistakes you might commit in the past or the future? And what did he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Should I not then love to be a thankful servant? So in other words, my standing in prayer until my feet crack is an expression of my gratitude to Allah. So where could someone get, I don't have to pray at all anymore because I've reached this special standing with Allah. So Imam Junaid, when he heard someone say something along these lines, he said, Yani wasalu. Wasalu ila saqar. He said, they arrived, at, all right, they arrived to hell. <laughs> Rahimahullah. So, uh, 
He sent the messengers to the religiously responsible. We're responsible before Allah. As a human being, this is part of our nature as humans. وَمَا خَلَقْلُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I've only created the jinn and humans to worship me. So we're responsible for the worship of Allah while we're in this world. And to instruct us and guide us, Allah sent messengers to instruct us. So he says, uh, uh, To guide them and to make clear to them the rulings related to the religion. With irrefutable proofs. And with clear arguments. أَحْمَدُهُ عَلَى جَمِيعِ النِّعَمِ I praise him for all of his blessings. وَأَسْأَلُهُ الْمَزِيدَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَكَرَمِ And I ask him for an increase from his grace and from his generosity. وَإِذَا أَسْأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ So if you want more knowledge, ask Allah for more knowledge. If you want more humility, ask Allah for more humility. From the things one of the hadith will cover, inshallah ta'ala, is uh, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, where he says he was riding before the, behind the Prophet one day, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Ya ghulam, inni u'allimuka kalimat, ihfad allaha yafadka, ihfad allaha tajidhu tujahak, wa idha sa'alta fas'al allah, wa idha sta'anta fast'in billah, so, oh lad, I'm going to teach you some expressions. Uh, please be, be mindful, be, preserve the rulings of Allah, and Allah will preserve you. And, and, uh, and if you ask of anything, I'm skipping a little. If you ask of anything, first and foremost, ask it of Allah. Ask it of Allah. So before you ask those means that Allah has created to... Execute his will. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. So you know you need a hundred dollars. Only Sister Aisha has a hundred dollars. Brother Ahmed has a hundred dollars. Before you go to Ahmed or Aisha, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Aisha or Ahmed is only a means that Allah has created to implement his will and his creation. So go to them first. Go to Allah first and foremost. So he says, uh, I praise him for all of his uh, blessings and I ask him for an increase from his grace and from his generosity. And no one is more generous than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're living proof of that. Look at all that Allah has given us in spite of ourselves. There's no one there's no one in this room. I could you know they say categorical statements are seldom true. But I'm confident this one is true. There's no one in this, this room who could say I'm more deserving of safety, security, ample food, clean water than all of those refugees in Syria. No one would say that. Because if you know those people, you know they're more pious than any of us. They're more learned, generally, than the generality of us. But Allah, out of His grace and His generosity, has chosen to bless us. He's chosen to bless us. And to bless others in other ways. And to test us with what He's blessed us with. And to test others in other ways. It's all about blessings and tests. Blessings and tests. All of it. Every blessing, there's a test embedded in it. Deprivation can be a blessing. Allahu Musta'an. Tayyip. So he says, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَحَّارُ So he says, I openly bear witness. There is no God except Allah. He is alone. He has no partners. And He is the one. He is the compelling. So we do what Allah compels us to do. 
We don't impose our will on Allah. Some people are deluded and deceived into believing that. Al Karim al Ghaffar, He is generous and He is most forgiving. And so I openly bear witness that Muhammad is his servant, his beloved, his, his intimately close beloved, the very best of all of creation. Khulla uh, is considered a, a higher form of love than mahabbah. So Habibuhu and Khaliluhu. This is an issue some of the scholars discuss, and most of them say the Khulla from Khalil, or from which we get Khalil is a higher and more intimate degree of love than Mahabba. May Allah bless us all to love him and to be beloved by him. And the two go together. Don't 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 be content with one without the other. When Allah mentions the people He will bring, if we turn back. So Allah Ta'ala doesn't need us, brothers and sisters. And this is what Imam Naw, if we can learn anything from his life, he understood his need for Allah and his need for Allah's grace. He understood any knowledge he had, it came from Allah. Any positive characteristics he had, they came from Allah. Allah doesn't need us, we need Allah. Uh, our Juma khutbah yesterday was on faqr, poverty, or need, better translation. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, antumul fuqara'u ilallahi, wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu al-hamid. O humankind, you are in desperate need of Allah, and Allah is free of all need, worthy of all praise. So we need Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the, so he says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِ فَسَوْفَ يَتِّ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ O oh, you who believe, if any of you turns back, turns back from what? Many commentators say, from assisting the religion of Allah. مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ عَنْ دِينِهِ Whoever turns back on his religion, so the... Meaning isn't necessarily apostasy, but turns back and doesn't assist and doesn't work and doesn't help. Allah will bring another people whom He will love and they will love Him. This is their first characteristics. يحبهم, he will love them. And they will love Him. So they're both. The love of Allah and to be loved by Allah. Harun remembers a song back in the day. The greatest uh, thing you could ever learn is to love. How's it go, Harun? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is to love and be loved in return. The greatest thing you can ever learn is to love and be loved in return. So it's one thing to love Allah, but to be loved by Allah, subhanAllah. To love and be loved in return. May Allah Ta'ala bless us the love and to be loved in return. So he says he's his Habib, he's his Khalil, the very best, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of creation. Al Mukarrumu bil Quran al Aziz al Mu'ajizat al Mustamirra, ala ta'aqu, ala ta'aqu bis sinin. And he's been blessed, he's been. Uh, graced or blessed with the Qur'an, the, the mighty Qur'an, which is a continuous miracle uh, through the passing of the years. And as the years pass, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an is only affirmed more and more and more and more and more. As we learn more about linguistics, as we learn more about the... the uh, Morphological structure of the Qur'an, the grammatical structure of the Qur'an, the semantic structure of the Qur'an. And, and these are modern science, semantics, linguistics. As we learn more and more, they're modern in a sense. The ancients took them to a modern level. The ancients amongst the Muslims. And, and grammar and morphology and 
linguistics and semantics. So we, we have scholars who, their work in these areas, uh, lexicography, the Kitab al Ain of uh, Khalil Ahmed al Farahidi, and other lexicons of Imam Zamakhshari and others. These are works that have surpassed anything the moderns have done. But as we do more and we learn more, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an is confirmed more and more and more and more and more. And so he says, بِالسُّنَنِ الْمُسْتَنِيرَةِ لِلْمُسْتَرْشِدِينَ And he's also come with the enlightened prophetic practices for those who seek guidance. So the sunnah is there. It's up to us to seek it. It's up to us to be the mustarshideen, those who seek to be guided by the prophetic way. We can neglect it or we can take advantage of it as a source of guidance. Sayyiduna Muhammad. al maqsus or maqsus al maqsusi bi jawami al-kalimi wa samahat al-deen who's been specifically designated sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a seminal speech. In other words, the ability to say volumes with very few words. And so these 40 hadith are generally speaking examples of that. So if you look at uh, Ibn Rajab's commentary or you look at Ibn uh, uh, Hajar Haytami's commentary, Imam Fashni's commentary on the Arba'in, you see that the one hadith that might be a few words, min husn islam al mar'i, tarku ma la ya'nihi. Khalas. A person's islam being good is leaving that which doesn't concern him or her. Whatever the case may be. You see on that hadith that we can say in five seconds, 50, 60, 70 pages of commentary in some instances. So this is from the gift of the Prophet Sallallahu to say much and very few words. وَسَمَحَةِ الدِّينِ And ease and laxitude in religion. Our religion is easy. If, if Allah had imposed a desire, we'd be praying right now. Because it, it would be 100 rakats for fajr. And 50 rakats for duha. Obligatorily. Not voluntarily. If Allah had willed. But He's given us ease and latitude in our religion. So you can't pray Dhuhr at 120, no problem. You can play it at 330. There's room. There's latitude. You know, finish what you're doing. It's very important and critical. You have time to pray. You should try to pray in the first of the time. So I see Imam Zay is encouraging people. Then it goes viral. <laughs> Try to play, pray at the beginning of the time. But if something prevents you, you're in traffic on the new span of the Bay Bridge, and you're marveling at the architectural wonder of it all, you have time. So when you get over the bridge, go to the tenderloin, step over bodies, Go into the Jones Street Masjid and pray. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa ala sa'ir al-nabiyin wa mursaleen wa ali kullin wa sa'ir al-salihin. May the blessings and peace of Allah be upon him and upon all of the prophets and messengers and the families of each and every one of them and on all of the righteous people. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to be amongst them. So these are transitional words that the Prophet ﷺ also used in his addresses after mentioning the name of Allah, praising Allah, and then to get to the main body of what's being said, these words, which is sometimes translated as, as for what follows. فَقَدْ رَوَيْنَا عَنْ عَلِيِّ بْنِ أَبِي طَالِبٍ وَعَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ مَسْعُودٍ وَمُعَاذِ بْنِ جَابِلٍ وَأَبِي الدَّرْدَاءِ وَبْنِ عُمَرَ وَبْنِ عَبَّاسٍ رضي الله عنه وَأَنَسٍ وَأَنَسِ بْنِ مَالِكٍ وَأَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ وَأَبِي سَعِيدٍ الْقُدْرِ رضي الله عنهم So he says that we relate 
uh, on the authority. In other words, this is from Imam Nawawi's. He's received all of these hadith with chains of narration. On the authority of Ali bin Abi Talib, Abdullah uh, ibn Mas'ud, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Abid Darda, ibn Umar, ibn Abbas, Anas ibn Malik, ibn, meaning son, uh, Abu Huraira, Abu Sa'id al, uh, al Qudri. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Man turukin kathiratin, wim riwayatin, mutanawiatin, anna Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal. So from many different paths and from various narrations from the Messenger of Allah, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him that he said, مَنْ حَفِظَ عَلَىٰ أُمَّةِ أَرْبَعِينَ حَدِيثًا مِنْ أَمْرِ دِينِهَا بَعَثُهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي زُمْرَةِ الْفُقَهَاءِ وَالْعُلَمَاءِ So he says that it's been related that the Messenger of Allah, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, whoever preserves for my community 40 hadith from the affairs of their religion, of from, from the affairs of, their, of the religion, Allah will resurrect him on the day of judgment or the day of resurrection. Well, Allah will bring him forth on the day of resurrection in the company of the jurists and the scholars. وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ بَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ فَقِيهًا عَلِمًا In another version, Allah will raise him up as a jurist or a scholar. وَفِي رِوَايَةِ أَبِ الدَّرْدَاء In the version of Abid Darda, وَكُنْتُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَافِعًا وَشَهِيدًا And on the day of resurrection, I will be one who will intercede for him and a witness for him. طيب. So he says, رَحِمُهُ اللَّهُ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ ابْنِ مَسْعُودِ In the version of the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, قِيلَ لَهَا قِيلَ لَهَا أُرْخُلْ مِنْ أَيِّ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ شِئْتْ It will be said to him, enter through any of the doors of paradise you desire. وَفِي رِوَاتِ بْنِ عُمَر In the version of Ibn Umar, كُتِبَ فِي زُمْرَةِ الْعُلَمَاءِ وَحُشِرَ فِي زُمْرَةِ الشُّهَدَاءِ So the version of Ibn Umar, it will, he will be recorded in the ranks of the scholars and he will be resurrected in the ranks of the martyrs. واتفق الحفاظ على أنه حديث ضعيف وانكثر طرقه. And the scholars, the great scholars of hadith, the hafaz, are in agreement, complete agreement, that this hadith is weak, a weak hadith, despite the uh, numerous chain, uh, paths that it's conveyed by. So the hadith is weak, but it's despite the many paths. Indicating the many paths of its narration does not elevate it to what's referred to as hadith hasan li ghayrihi. So it's weak in and of itself, but substantiating evidence from other hadith elevates it to hasan. He said this uh, degree of substantiation provided by these various chains does not exist. So he's reminding us of that. وَقَدْ صَنَّفَ الْعُلَمَاءُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ فِي هَذَا الْبَابِ مَا لَا يُحْصَى مِنَ الْمُصَنَّفَاتِ And he says that the scholars, may, Allah's, may Allah be pleased of them, have compiled in this particular area, 40, gathering 40 hadith, a number of compilations that can't be counted. So many of our greatest scholars have worked on the basis of this hadith. Then he says, فَأَوَّلُوا مَنْ عَلِمْتُهُ صَنَّثَ فِيهِ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ حِبْنُ الْمُبَارَكِ The first one that I uh, have learned who has compiled a work of 40 hadith is Abdullah bin al-Mubarak. And some people say, well, we'll come back to this. ثُمَّ ابْنُ أَسْلَمَ التُوسِي And then uh, ابْنُ أَسْلَمَ التُوسِي الْعَالْمُ الرَّبَّانِ who was a, a very... Pious scholar. ثم الحسن بن سفيان النسائي وأبو بكر وأبو بكر الأجوري أو الأجيري. Two relay narrations of that name. The jim with the dhamma or with the kasra. وأبو بكر محمد بن إبراهيم الأصفهاني 
والدار قطني والحاك والحاكم وأبو نعيم وأبو عبد الرحمن السلامي وأبو سعيد الماليني وأبو عثمان الصابوني وعبد الله بن محمد محمد الأنصاري وأبو بكر أبو بكر البيهقي وقلائق لا يحسون من المتقدمين والمتأخرين. So he says that the first one I've learned to compile in this area is are the names that we mentioned. Well, no need in the interest of time to reiterate the names. You heard them. Now, some people say that Imam Nawawi is making an appeal to authority. So, and, theref- and that this is not uh, a sound argument. In other words, the fact that the hadith is weak, we shouldn't work with it. And... Imam now is appealing to the authority of all of these great luminaries of Hadith scholars to imply that we should work with it. So Imam now we are simply stating a fact. He's, he's not making any sort of appeal. And also if he is, that doesn't mean the argument is invalid. So Zaytuna college students love to study logic. So... Uh, Every fallacy doesn't imply that the argument's invalid. So one should be cognizant of that. So in any case, he's just stating a fact. The fact that Abdullah bin al-Mubarak, the fact that Imam al qutni one of the most critical hadith scholars, and students of hadith know this, Imam al qutni is one of the harshest critics of Imam Bukhari and Muslim. Rahimahumullahu jami'an. But Imam Dar Qutni has compiled a work in 40 hadith. So, and these scholars, and he says, many others who can't be counted from amongst the earlier scholars, al mutaqaddimin and the latter scholars, al mutakhirin So he's stating a fact. And this is a fact. It's not, you could do with it what you want. You could discard it. You could say, you know, this practice or this hadith has been worked with and accepted by the ulama or you could reject it but Imam Nawawi is simply stating a fact uh, inshallah we'll stop here because there's only about 7 minutes left we'll finish the introduction next week and then we'll move on to the first hadith inshallah ta'ala. and what I can guarantee you inshallah ta'ala, over the course of the year we will finish Imam Nawawi's commentary on these 40 hadith, inshallah ta'ala. What we'll do, uh, I, I will say this, what we'll do with each hadith, the translation will suffice as uh, terms of identifying the meanings of the words, so we won't engage in a linguistic study of each hadith. We will mention something that's not mentioned in his commentary, who narrates the hadith, just to give you an idea of the wide uh, dissemination of these hadith in the uh, early generations uh, of the ummah and to give you an, a sense of the, the nature of these hadith then we'll go through the translation the reading of the hadith in Arabic translation of the hadith in English as we said mentioning those who narrated the hadith and then going through Imam Nawawi's commentary on the hadith and then from uh, various sources of commentary on the hadith uh, mention some of the lessons very briefly in bullet point fashion that we can extract from the hadith. So that, that's the basic uh, outline of how we'll approach the hadith. So we'll stop here. Uh, any questions or comments that any of you might have, we'll entertain them at this time. There's a mic for the Q&A. Just raise your hand if you want to use the mic. Fahim is Afghani, but he's not the kite runner, he's the mic runner. <laughs> he'll, he'll run to you and bring you the mic, inshallah. No. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli Sayyidina Muhammad. When he says that when the hadith is da'if, even if its narrations are... We didn't get there next. That's next week. Uh, we we, read, uh, we, we read this part. When he goes back to saying, Oh, okay. 
Um, so he's saying despite the fact that these hadiths no, 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 no. Are, uh, no. So even then it doesn't elevate to Hassan. Not in this case. Uh, because the, the, the nature of the weakness isn't such that each narration is slightly weak. So each narration is weak for various reasons. But the weakness isn't attributed, for example, to the weakness of, a, of the memory of one of the narrators, for example. And so another narration that might also be weak for another uh, reason that's not uh, terribly problematic. So in each of the narrations, there's something that's significantly problematic. So because of that, as I said, it doesn't elevate it to hasan li ghayrihi. So what you're referring to is a hadith that's not very weak. And so a substantiating evidence elevates it to the rank of Hassan. This is not the case here. No. So it remains da'if and it never, none of the narrations elevate to Hassan the ghayrihi So any other questions? If not, then uh, our, our time has pretty much expired. And as I said, next week we'll continue with the introduction. There are a few uh, uh, points to be made in, in the context of what remains of the introduction. And so we'll, we'll mention those. Uh, what, what I, I, let me finish what, in that case, since there's 30 seconds left. When I mentioned Abdullah bin al-Mubarak, who was one of the great early uh, Muslims, it's said that he would spend a year, uh, one year he would go to Hajj, and the next year he would spend on the frontiers defending uh, the faith. And he died on the frontiers defending the faith. He was one of the great early scholars and narrator of Hadith. He also was one of the first to compile a book of Zuhd, so one of the earliest, Kitab al-Zuhd. And it's an, it's an extant published uh, book, is the Kitab al-Zuhd, the Abdullah bin al-Mubarak. So some people, they say uh, Abdullah bin al-Mubarak was known to work with weak hadith, so he shouldn't be uh, trusted. The fact that he compiled an arba'in shouldn't give us uh, satisfaction of believing this is a hadith we should work with. They also uh, argue that he's one of the people who was well known to have prayed Salat al-Tasbih. So this is another issue people differ on, is the hadith that relates to Salat al-Tasbih. Is it sound to work with? The, one of the uh, points made by those who accept it is that Abdullah bin al-Mubarak uh, accepted that hadith and was known to perform the Salat al-Tasbih. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, that his judgment, because these are human judgments, is one that we should esteem because of his closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and because of the stature of of uh, of his knowledge. So, if there's a difference of the of opinion, we should tend to give the benefit of the doubt to those who are more pious and far greater than any of us, and not to say, you know, oh, we don't accept Abdullah bin al Mubarak. Okay, that's you want to approach, approach things that way, but I accept him. No. Uh, Bismillah, we just wanted to take a quick question from Edil, who's joining us online. Why are some people rejecting a hadith? I'm talking about the Muslims who say that a hadith are mostly changed and that we should mostly study the Quran instead. Uh, number one is, is, is primarily due to their ignorance. Uh, so the general teachings of our religion are not widely known these days. And so a lot of people are ignorant of those teachings. And uh, so because of their ignorance, number one, they don't understand uh, how the hadith were gathered and narrated. Uh, they don't understand the distinctions between hadith. Uh, one, and, and, and also they don't understand the centrality of hadith in explaining the Qur'an and in uh, defining for us our acts of worship. 
So the first thing I would ask anyone who says they only accept the Quran, do you pray your five prayers? And assuming they're a good Muslim, they say yes, then where is in the Quran? Two rakats for Fajr, four for Dhur, four for Asr, three for Maghrib, four for Isha. All of that comes from the Hadith. You know, do you fast the month of Ramadan? Do, do, how do you de de determine the details related to the fast? Do you uh, pay your zakat? How do you determine the details related to the zakat? So there's a lot of ignorance. Also, how did the Quran reach us? The Quran reached us the same way Mutawat or Hadith reached us. So if you say you accept the Qur'an, at the very least you have to accept Hadith Mutawatir. Because it comes, the Hadith is related to us by groups upon groups, Bittawatur. And the Qur'an, there are narrations of Qur'an that are ahad, that aren't considered to be canonical, acceptable narrations to read. So a person who says, I only accept Quran, minimally has to accept Hadith Mutawatir. Minimally. And so there's a lot of ignorance, may Allah. And also, uh, it's an effort to uh, manipulate the religion. So if, if I reject the details related to the Hadith, uh, to the religion rather, related by Hadith, because I don't like them, there's the I again, we go back to the beginning of the class, I can fill in the blanks based on what I like because I've sidelined the hadith. And so now I could fill in the blanks. So I would say all of that comes into play. The latter, we will hope not in the case of anyone the questioner knows, but for some people that comes into play. I don't like this. I don't think the Prophet would ever say or do this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, I don't accept hadith and I will make the determination as to what constitutes accurate or flawed teachings in the religion. Uh, there's something I, I, I did forget to mention that I will mention now, is, and that was related to the Arba'in itself, that the, the Arba'in had, well, I'll do it next week so I don't have to rush, inshallah. So we'll stop here. Are there any more questions online, Harun? That's it. Tayyip. Allah yubarik fikum yataqabbal. Huh? Okay. Sorry. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. The hadith that's related to the 40, memorizing the 40 hadith, is that for any hadith? Or is that for the ones that, I mean, how did Imam Nawawi choose the 40 well, hadith? Well, that's part of next week. He'll get to that. But generally, it's someone choosing 40 hadith to preserve and pass on from the prophetic teachings. And so as he'll point out next week, some have done this in the area of uh, law. So 40 hadith of legal teachings, 40 hadith of spiritual teachings, 40 hadith of moral teachings. Ibn Hajar Asqalani, one of our great hadith scholars, has an arba'in in the rights of brotherhood and sisterhood. So his 40 hadith all deal with uh, reinforcing and encouraging strong bonds of, of brotherhood between the believers. So, in these areas, as, and so this is something Imam Nawawi discusses in his introduction. So, it's collecting 40 hadith and then preserving those for, for the ummah. So, we'll stop here for, for sure, inshallah. Allah barik fikum ya taqabbal minkum kulla khayru wa zarikum allahu fi kulla khayru. ونسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى لكم ولنا وللمسلمين جميعا التوفيق والعافية إنه على كل شيء قدير وإنه سبحانه بالحمد جدير وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما, بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا خالصا لوجهك الكريم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شروا لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك ورأسك إن الإنسان لا في خص إلا الذين آمنوا عمل الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.